I'm going to talk about reverse engineering and um, sort of why I find it interesting and some tools to dive in. I would encourage you all to shout out questions if you have things that come up as we go along and to, um, yeah, don't, don't be afraid to um, give me any questions. So um, I'm going to run through sort of a who and then a what, why, and how. I want to talk about reverse engineering uh, not only sort of at like a technical level of how it is, but also a little more philosophical level, why it's interesting to me and why um, I sort of care about it and think you guys should all too. So um, first, um, I'm Evan Carmi. I do sort of a variety of different things, um, but I um, sort of like to think of myself as an open source contributor. Um, have you guys heard of Docker or Django? Yeah? But Python boo, right? So um, for Docker, I added um, three lines to a documentation file once. And I'm really proud in Django, I added a missing letter R. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. So, um, so what is reverse engineering? We have a lot of abstractions in our lives, in engineering, in computer science. To me, reverse engineering is curiosity applied to one of these abstractions. It's trying to figure out what is inside a black box. So abstraction is absolutely necessary for life, and it's utterly ubiquitous. But, um, and and we, we, we need it. We have to zoom out a level and just assume that the framework's going to work. In computer science, we assume that P is not equal to NP, that privacy and cryptography will work, and we build on top of that. But we don't always know that to be true. And we build languages like Ruby that are nicer than writing machine code to use. So to me, reverse engineering is trying to zoom inside a black box, trying to look into it, and to, to really just to find out what's going on. So in this black box, you see, oh, there's a component that uses the cloud, right? Um, but we have to be careful because there's really an infinite layer of, of abstraction. You can go deeper and deeper and deeper. So, you know, you say, okay, well, this black box uses this thing that connects to the cloud, but wait, how does the cloud work? And we could keep going on and on and on. But let's not go there for right now. So why is reverse engineering interesting? Why is it important? To me, because of learning. Someone before asked, okay, how do you learn to be, how do you learn stuff about, you know, programming or about security? To me, I think, well, I want to see how things work. I'm curious about how they work. How does a web app work? How is it structured? If you want to learn, you don't learn in a vacuum. If you want to learn to write better, you don't just write, you also read. You also see the way things work. The way things work. And sometimes, that's easy. With, with reading and writing, you can just go and you know, read something and, and find something. Um, if you're trying to read Shakespeare, you can you know, count the syllables and see that it's an iambic pentameter. But you can't always do that with software. Sometimes you need tools or techniques to, you know, look under the hood. So, um, if you want to get better at programming or Rails, I think these skills are utterly important to just learn more about how things work, learn more about what's going on inside. And I find it very, very um, interesting. And, um, and in addition to being a, a learning tool, you can also use it to build services to build APIs using, um, using these things that aren't always available. For example, let's say um, you want to work with iCloud and maybe create some kind of contact database. This is something that I was working on previously where I learned a lot of this stuff. I was trying to build a tool that connected with iCloud, like um, the contacts app on your Mac, for example. And we wanted to build a Rails server that would act as, um, you know, that would, that would communicate. And to do that, you have to look at the way that a current, you know, uh, a native app like contacts.app communicates with the server and try to simulate it or um, act like it. Okay, so how many of you have ever gotten this question in an interview or given this question in an interview? How does the internet work? None of you? Okay. How about asks like, you know, when you type in google.com in a browser and something gets on your web screen and it gets it's on the page? Have that one? Yeah, anyone there? A little bit? Okay. So I actually like this question a lot because it's very open-ended and you can see what kind of, um, how, how deep people want to go. But um, if you want to, you know, 
figure that out and say, okay, well, how does this work? How do you how do you find that answer? One option is you go to Quora and you memorize. Okay, well, the first thing is that the browser does this, but that's not quite as interesting to me as actually seeing that happen on my own machine. I want to say, okay, well, I type this in. You know, what actually happens? And um, so so we can we can zoom zoom in, start looking at these abstractions, or we can zoom out. So one way of zooming in is to look at the packet. And you can use a tool like TCP, uh, TCP dump to like, dive in and say, OK, what are all the packets that are flowing on a network interface? But I'm a big command line fan. I use Vim. I'm all into that stuff. But this is like, eh. no, this is hard to, hard to read. It's not very informative. If I wanted to parse it, sure, that could be useful. But I'm not. I just want to gain some information about it. So let's sort of go up a level briefly. OK, so now we're here at Wireshark. Wireshark is, they call themselves a network protocol analyzer. And it's a tool that pretty much looks at packets and provides more information about them. So you can just turn this on on your computer. And you can just start seeing, oh, look at the traffic that's going back and forth. And it can be really interesting to see, oh, so this isn't what happens. First, there's some DNS requests made. And then I see that there's an HTTP GET request made. And that's in one packet. And then I have another packet come back. So this can all be an interesting way if you're curious about learning about packets. But to me, eh, packets are a little, a little too deep. So rather, I like to look at the request and the response cycle. And this is a tool called Charles, which is an HTTP proxy that really just lets you see all of your HTTP and encrypted HTTPS traffic between your machine and the internet. So this is really nice because you can see um, you can see things at a level of, of, of abstraction that we're often used to. So for me, I am often building web apps in Rails. And the level of abstraction I'm used to is creating a response object that gets sent back to a client. So I'm not like, you know, OK, I'll have these three packets. And, you know, it's, no, we're, we're talking about responses here. We have something else that, deal, that deals with that part for us. So to be able to see, OK, here's a request that comes in. And then here's a response that goes out is a really nice way of seeing that level of, of abstraction. So here in Charles, I made a request just to my browser to calligator.org. And I saw, OK, well, there's a request that goes out. And then afterwards, I get back a response. It took this amount of time. It was this size. And you can sort of just look under the hood. This is similar to using inspect element in Chrome. But this is just a little bit more, um, you can use this more than just in you know, Chrome or your web browser. You can use it in other places. And you can actually see what's going on here. You can see the order, and you can see a lot of stuff. So it's really interesting. OK, but this was about when I was like, OK, we got to bring this back to Ruby, right? So how do we use Charles with Ruby? Well, if you just use some Ruby code, and you run Charles, you see this. Nothing happens. It doesn't work. Um, Charles works out of the box with browser traffic and other applications, but not with Ruby code. So you need to tell your Ruby stuff to go through it and use it as a proxy. So a proxy would be, you know, you tell your code to go through Charles and then it goes to final destination. So if you're using, um, let's use Faraday because net HTTP is just terrible, right? Everyone, yeah. Um, and so Faraday is just an HTTP client library, it's just a gem. And um, the normal way of making a request is Faraday.get. You could do something for Caligator. This will not use a proxy. So if you wanted to use a proxy, you'd have to create a connection object. And Charles uses the port 3128 by default. You create this connection object, and then you send your traffic through it. And if you do that, then you'll see a request. And you're like, cool, OK, I just made a request in my Ruby code or in your Rails code. And now I can see that in Charles. So if we look at these two um, places, we sort of can see some different levels of um, of abstraction some different levels of stuff. So if you were to make a request like we did just before and look at the request headers that you see in your Ruby code on the, on the Faraday side, you'll see only one header, which says there's a user agent, Faraday in the version. OK, but now if you look at that same thing in Charles, you see a little bit more information. You see that there's also an accept encoding header and a few other things. So that's sort of interesting, like, oh, there's more to what's actually happening than just what I see on the Ruby end, on the, on the, on the version I'm seeing in my, you know, in here in a pry or wherever you are. And now when you look at the response, you also see, OK, it's mostly the same. But the one thing that is different is that the content encoding of gzip is not on 
the response object you get back in, in Ruby because the, op, the, the response which was gzipped has been ungzipped and now it's just sitting there. And it seems like Faraday also takes out that header. So that's interesting. If you have a bug in your gzip implementation, it might be something that you want to look into to see if that's a place where, where you're having some, um, some problems. Okay, so that's sort of like the very basic, simple use of sending um, something through a proxy. But what if you are using a gem that, re that, that interfaces with an external API? Like maybe you're trying to talk to Instagram or Google or any of these other things. Maybe you have, um, you know, you use OAuth for sign-ins. Okay, well the OAuth process needs to make requests to the server. Oftentimes these are hidden to you because it's just a black box of functionality that you say, okay, OAuth gem, I set you up like this. But if it doesn't work, you want to dive into that. So a really nice way of diving into that is just to see, okay, well, what, what are the requests getting me? What's coming back? So if you Google this, the typical solution is something like this. A Stack Overflow, which is a monkey patch of OAuth2 client class where they define the connection, and then they just force the proxy into this. I find this quite icky, quite fragile, and I'm not a fan of it. Um, if the OAuth2 client ever changes, then you're going to have to, if this, if this, if this um, method changes, then you'll have to, you know, there could be an error here, and it's just, it's just sort of fragile and messy. And additionally, if you're using OAuth and also a few other gems, you have to do this for every single one. So just to get your traffic to go through, it could be, you know, monkey patching all this stuff. Like, no, let's just, let's just not go there. So what can we do if we want to go at a different level? So this is an approach I came up with, which is also monkey patching, so it's not wonderful. But I like it a lot more. So what we're saying is, OK, assuming that OAuth and many other gems use Faraday, which a lot of gems do use Faraday now to connect to the internet, what we do here in instead is we say, OK, I know that Faraday all, whether it's Faraday.get or some other method, it uses the Faraday connection initialize method. So we say, OK, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take their initialize method, alias it as old initialize, and then I'm just going to inject my proxy um, option parameter on top of that and then use their old method again and call that. So I call that in the old initialize. What's nice about this is, sure, it's somewhat fragile, fragile if the signature of Faraday connection changes, the signature being um, the arguments, the, the, the parameter arguments, and the, the, the structure. But it's much more robust than the previous solution. And additionally, if you use OAuth and a bunch of other gems that use Faraday, this one thing will send all your traffic through your proxy. So I find this is a much nicer way to um, you know, just you know, toss this in um, in your code base and be able to say, OK, here's what's going on. So you can toss this in an initializer, for example, something called like debugging tools. And then um, you'll start to see traffic going through your, your proxy, which can be really cool. And um, if you're looking at, is that a question? Okay, and if you're and if you're making um, HTTPS requests and you're trying to look at that traffic, you might get an error saying, "Okay, we can verify that that was actually um, the server," which is a good error because you are looking at your traffic. And so, um, what we have to do here is we have to say, "Okay, disable the verification," meaning we are we are like middlemanning ourselves. We're looking at our own traffic. Um, but this is very this is. If you want to look at your stuff and you want to see, okay, so what's the actual core request that's being sent to, to Google to authenticate, then you can see it that way. But do not ship this to prod. <laughs> so um, <laughs> on the slide, that's the tag on there, you know, get ignore the file or just be sure that this doesn't get out into the wild. Um, although, um, I mean, probably what would happen is, yeah, the SSL would then um, be, a, be bad, but then any requests would also break because there's no proxy. Anyways, don't, don't try that. Okay. So um, now with all of this set up, what do we have left to do? If we want to build a hidden API of some sort, what we can do is we can use these tools to look at the functionality of a native app, or that could be a web page or a website or something, and see how does this work? What does it do naturally? And then in Ruby, you can create requests that simulate that. So if you are trying to, um, you know, fetch a list of users from Twitter using, you know, something like that. If you want to repeat their functionality, you would say, okay, well, I see that this is happening on the, you know, the Twitter client. I want to I wanna do something similar. 
So you can you know, repeat that. Or in my scenario, I was taking, OK, the contacts.app on Mac does this to communicate with the iCloud server. So I want to simulate that in Ruby. And so I then make you know, requests in Faraday, or however you do them, that do a similar thing. So they create a new contact by doing something similar. And oftentimes you'll find errors because things are different. So what I find really useful is to have both the original request and also, um, so the, the original request being like the native client request, be going through Charles using the normal Mac proxy. And then additionally, you would send your, your Ruby code through there too. And then you can see them both side by side. And one would work and one might return a 500. And then in Charles, you can like modify the request and you can just do edit. And then you just have the, the blank text of the full request, the headers and everything. And you can modify that however you like. So you might say, OK, well, I was creating the body in my Ruby code. I'll take that body and toss it into the native client's body and see if my body is valid. If that works, then that tells me, OK, well, I think my body is valid, but the headers must not align. And that's why um, you know, if that works there, but that doesn't, then you can sort of um, narrow it down to figure out which part is working, which is not. And so this is really um, a very useful method for um, combining things together. Um, and so um, I really like Charles just because it's pretty simple. There's a few other tools similar to it called Burp and some other things that are a little, I think a little bit more advanced, but um, it, it fits really nicely into, um, you know, if you're doing stuff on the re request response cycle, it floats in there really nicely and it's pretty, pretty easy to use. Sorry, what was the name of the other tool? Um, Burp, I think, B-U-R-P. Yeah. But, um, and, and Charles is um, not free, but it has a trial um, that you can play around with it. I think Burp is free, yeah. Other questions? Okay, well, um, that's really all I got for you. Um, I am a consultant looking for some work. If anyone is interested in learning more about this stuff, and you can find me online. So let me know if you have other questions. <laughs>